welcome everyone to the Ivy podcast. Uh, before I introduce our guest, which is I'm very excited about this episode, talk to him. Uh, I want to just a quick favor to all of our listeners. When you get a chance, just go to iTunes and leave us a review uh, for our episode, our, our show, because it means a lot to us and actually helps us a lot with the growth. So just a quick favor. And we would really appreciate that. So thank you so much. And so today I'm very excited to introduce Christian Schweitzer. He is the president of the HBS Alumni Angels Association, which I'm part of. And I'm very excited to talk to you about all of the things, angel investing, the state of the startup scene here in South Florida. So welcome, Christian. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, much appreciate your time. I know you're very busy. You have the full-time job and then you're also the president of the HBS Alumni Angels. So uh, you, you probably, you know, wear, wear multiple hats. So before we talk a little bit about the current role in terms of, uh, the angels group, tell us a little bit about your background. You're the kind of the thumbnail version of your, of your accomplishments. All right. Well, I've been born and raised in Switzerland. I actually did all my schools and education in Switzerland, except HBS. I was lucky enough after grad school to be nominated to go and do an international internship at the time, which was with IBM in New York. And that's where my US venture somehow started. I did that internship for a little bit more than a year. I went back actually to Europe, I was working for IBM there, I was working for Dell computers. I was very much in the IT industry. And then I came back to the US to continue my time in the US because I thought my initial internship was kind of like short to really kind of like no more. So I went back to New York. I started to look around for another opportunity and IBM just said, yes, we love to have you back. And I was with IBM after that for almost 17 years. And then I started to look for some other opportunities. I moved to South Florida and I started to work for the accounting company, Carlton Rosson here in Miami. I've been doing this for two years and I do the marketing analytics and inter intelligence for them and for the group of Carl from Ralston. Well, that's super exciting. And thanks for, for the overview of your career. It seems, you know, to be very diverse. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the current role as the president of the HBS Alumni Angels. How did you get involved? How did that all come about? Tell us uh, kind of the history behind that. Yeah, it actually started by talking to a good friend of mine she is in uh, Spain, and she actually taught me about the angels group they have in Madrid, about the HBS alumni angels group. And I was thinking, hey, this is a good thing. Why don't we have this, you know, here in Miami as well? So I called the president of the HBS club at the time and said, you know, I would like to be involved with the angels group of HBS here in Miami. And he said, well, sorry, that does not exist. I don't really know how the conversation went and went, but somehow we ended up me being the person who gets this started. And I've been doing this. It's in 2018, we started the Angels Group. We actually had a good kickoff in 2019. So basically two years now in the business and I'm loving it ever since. Uh, we've grown quite a lot from the beginning. You know, we had zero members. Now we have more than 50. In the beginning, we had zero companies we invested. Now we have like five or six. And I've been the president now for two years. And I must say, I probably got out of it more myself than the actually organization got out of me. Um, it's a learning core for everybody, including myself. Well, that's super exciting. What a story. You know, it didn't even exist. And here you are. You actually formed it, which, you know, I'm very fortunate and lucky to be part of. Uh, and, you know, to go a little bit backwards, as far as your personal interest in angel investing, where is that coming from? How, how did you all come about to get into that? Yeah, and I think our members, you know, we have about five, 50, 55 members, and you probably can put them into three categories. You know, number one is people who have been angel investors for quite some time. They've been there, they've done that, they're very good. They have this kind of like sense of what to look for. So they are almost professionals. And then you have people that in the category two who have somehow experience in the industry. Maybe they were with a venture capital, maybe they were or still are with some type of private equity. They're kind of like know a little bit the industry and they just want to do a little bit more about this. 
And then I have the third category, which probably I go under, are people who have an interest about angel investing, but don't know much about it. They want to learn how it goes. They want to learn what to do and look for and just have fun with it. And uh, I want to do exactly that. You know, I wanted to kind of like expand a little bit what I've been doing already as a professional, you know, in my marketing career and do something a little bit different. And keep in mind, you know, we are the HBS Alumni Angel South Florida. We are a completely volunteer based organization. So there's nobody on the payroll that does any due diligence or selecting of startups or anything. So it's all based on our members' time, including my time. And I just really wanted to kind of like get my feet wet a little bit in the investment um, ecosystem, if you want, and kind of like to learn a little bit, you know, how it's all about to go. And specifically, I wanted to help the uh, startup ecosystem in how, here in South Florida to make my contribution, to make it grow and to have some input of it. Right, right, right. No, that, that's a great way to put this kind of these different categories of how people actually come get introduced to angel investing. Uh, I kind of fall into in between having been a founder operator of multiple startups myself in my previous life and even the current life. I'm part of an organization that I'm a co-founder of, but it's really taking that experience where I had failed a lot of startups myself. And, you know, luckily I had one exit, but overall it's just been a very, very, you know, the journey of learning, continuous learning journey. And what I wanted to do always is to take all of those lessons learned from that experience and the people that have helped me through this, you know, through this process and pay it forward, you know, in a sense to now go on the other side of the spectrum and really be that value add investor. So I'm not just only investing from financial standpoint, but really helping these startups grow uh, and go to the next level based on some of the things that I had done for my companies. So that's very uh, kind of my perspective onto angel investing. And I'm actually working on a course uh, for the immigrant angel investors here in US because uh -huh. uh, us being immigrants, like you from Switzerland, I'm from Kazakhstan. And I, right. yeah, I, a lot of times I invest into startups that are led by immigrant founders because there's something to be said about being that kind of an outsider coming from a completely different, you know, culture and background and coming here trying to succeed with that little bit of a chip on the shoulder. Uh, I find that very interesting. And I think there's a great segment of the immigrant angel investors as well who Absolutely. like looking for those opportunities. So that's kind of what keeps me busy these days. Uh, but Christian, in terms of when you, obviously you've been part of a lot of pitch nights, a lot of presentations, you look at a lot of startups, a lot of applications that submit to us. Um, what are some of the very early indicators that you pay attention to when you look at potential startup for an investment? First of all, when we talk about kind of the product market fit, what are some of the things that you pay attention to in terms of their traction, their ability to get, generate some type of interest from the segment that they targeting? Share yeah. with us any thoughts from that perspective. Yeah, and you know, angel investing is also a very personal thing because it's usually those are individuals, they put their own personal money into an entrepreneur's venture. And for me personally, it's really looking into companies where I think, oh, I absolutely need to have this product. And I think others will as well. And really believing, you know, that is something that I would buy. Of course, if it's consumer product, that's easy because it's somebody that maybe everybody can buy. If it's like a specialized medical device where I would not be the payer, that's a little bit more tricky, but I'm trying to put myself always in consumer or in consumer shoes and see, is this really something I would just pay any price, you know, just to get this as, as a service or, or as a product. Also, I look very much into the entrepreneur himself. You know, what is the entrepreneur's background? Where did, where did he come from? How did they get to this venture? Is this something that came naturally out of them? Is it something that they were working on it for quite some time or is it just a new idea? You know, it's, it's one thing to really be in love with the product or service that the company you know, brings to the market. And it's another thing to actually get in love with the entrepreneur that actually brings this to the market. And I really wanna actually invest in a company where the entrepreneur not only knows what he or she is doing, but also kind of has the soft skills you know, to really bring this into market. 
you know, how to handle crisis, how to deal with uncertainties, uh, how they speak, how they behave, how they, you know, treat other people, how they treat during pitch night, you know, maybe their colleagues or investors, possible investors. I look to very small, you know, soft skills cues, because you can be absolutely sure, you know, this will not be a smooth ride for any entrepreneur you know, to go and market and bring something, you know, to success. There will be a lot of stones in the way. There will be a lot of hurdles to overcome. And, you know, we've a really good, I want to believe, you know, well-rounded skill set, you know, from a soft skill point of view and from an experience point of view makes you much more, makes you much more equipped to actually handle those challenges and those unexpected items that come your way. Right, absolutely. I love the those insights because I subscribe to some, you know, some to, somewhat of a very similar thesis around looking at the founder market fit. Because when I invest into startups, I really like to get to know the founder first on a personal level. Because <clears throat> at the end of the day, if we're investing into the company, we're probably going to be attached at the hip for the next ten years, and it's almost you know being comfortable with each other to have very honest conversations when things don't go well can we sit down you know over a beer and talk about hey here's some of the things i'm very worried about or here's some of the areas that i think we're really messing up on so just having that relationship and also something that really helped me in the past and some of the successful deals that i've been part of is really not really jump into the actual investment at the very beginning but also almost test out the founder from a standpoint of let me first deliver some value. Let me introduce you to some folks or let me introduce you to potential customers and actually see how you handle that. Uh, and seeing founder in action, I think it really, a lot of times that, that tells me a lot about how they operate because you'd be surprised a lot of times you have a great conversation, but then you introduce them to somebody and there's no action. I think that's also kind of a, somewhat of an indicator that maybe that's not the best fit for what I'm looking for in a particular founder. Um, when, when we talk about kind of looking at startups and entrepreneurs, and I get this question a lot where they are extremely early stage, they're even, you know, pre-product, they, they just got some, some idea on the napkin, but great ambitions, great, you know, plans. What, what's your take on looking at startups like that, especially in current market where we see some crazy valuations and crazy investments based on just an idea uh, completely, mm -hmm. not even anything around revenue. What are your thoughts around that? What is your recommendation for founders or startup, you know, CEOs that's in this stage and they trying to raise funding, but at the same time, they, they're extremely early stage. Very often, also in very early stage, you know, entrepreneurs, they come out with like a revenue model, you know, where they have like, huge expectation with fantastic numbers where they're going to say we're going to have millions of dollars of revenue after one or two or five years i hardly look any numbers like that you know i really go straight to the actual products to the actual solution what's the problem they're trying to solve how big is that problem i'm looking at all the numbers about the problem not really about the solution how much they could sell so you know that may be a little bit of you know interesting news for entrepreneurs that I hardly look, you know, at their revenue protection numbers, but I really look at the actual products and what the problem is to solve. Plus, where do they come from with this idea? You know, is this something they struggled themselves? They had that problem themselves and they found a solution for that? Or is it just kind of like an idea they heard from somebody else? I very much favor the situation where there is kind of like a life situation of an entrepreneur and that entrepreneur tried to find a solution, couldn't find it, and then decided, okay, I'm just gonna solve this problem myself. And then maybe, you know, discovers that this is maybe not only a good solution for me, but also for others. And then do some tests and see, okay, yes, it could be. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, it's recently the HBS Alumni Angels of South Florida invested in neurotraining, an entrepreneur that had some medical problems and he looked to find a solution for this medical problem, he find it, and he developed a solution for himself, which is kind of like an exercise suit, and uh, made it kind of like his venture. And uh, we now are in really early stage to get them funded and get them started. And it's very exciting to actually see where this is going to go. Yeah, that's very exciting. And with with you being exposed to so many different 
industries and startup ideas and the trends that they try to cater to. For you personally, what are the different trends and you know industry insights that you're very passionate about? What are you researching? What are you what are you very interested in? What do you think is the next big thing? Wow, Jan, that's a question. So I'm very passionate about specifically here in South Florida to see the entire startup ecosystem, you know, so where it's going. You know, this is a lot of momentum we are allowed to experience here right now in South Florida. And I'm very bullish, you know, just in general about, you know, startups and early stage companies. I also like the fact that the industries that we are kind of like emerging are very much around the medical health tech, medical device type of industry. And there's also a lot of talk about climate tech, you know, here in South Florida as well, with, you know, raising sea levels and everything. So those are items that I personally passionate about this and kind of like see really nice, nice to see that we have somehow of a merge between entrepreneurship and solving those big problems, you know, in climate, in medical and other areas. And uh, makes me very, very excited actually being here right now in South Florida. Right, absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more with you on the state of South Florida in general with kind of morphing into the kind of almost the, the tech hub uh, of, you know, in, in the in the national level, not just not just here in the South. Uh, you know, the Miami Tech Week alone, I think that was, you know, one of the very first and very successful events with a lot of VCs, with a lot of founders, with a lot of other companies, even from the Silicon Valley coming and, you know, exploring the market. I think that's that's very exciting, very challenging, you know, also challenging. So it's very, very exciting to see what are some of the things to come about. Absolutely. Um, I also kind of like think about it, you know, what COVID, in the beginning of COVID, we all were thinking, you know, okay, what's it's going to be the upside of this? And then probably very early, we found that, okay, working from home is probably something here to stay. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the startup ecosystem, we also discovered very quickly, you know, entrepreneurs now discover you don't have to necessarily live in the Bay Area. You know, you could be anywhere. And clearly it's something that we could benefit here in South Florida and Miami as well, but other cities too, let's be honest, right? You have the same thing in, in Boston, Atlanta, Austin, Texas, so they all have a little bit of a boost because of that. I think we have a little bit of extra boost here in South Florida because this is not a new thing. You know, we were very high up in the uh, startup activities even like four or five years ago. And now we just started to, to kind of like, you know, earn the fruits if you want, you know, from all those labor before. Right, right, right. Absolutely. No, the timing is impeccable. Um, we briefly touched upon the concept of a value add investor. And it's an interesting dynamic is because I've been on the both sides of the spectrum. And there's that interesting sentiment between the two sides where the, you know, the founders, uh, you know, if you ask the majority of them, they don't necessarily have the most positive outlook of, you know, the, the VC industry in general. Uh, and then vice versa, where the VC this side always views that, yes, we're absolute value add. Uh, we're just, you know, we're just there to help the companies grow. What, what's your take on becoming a genuine value add investor just beyond the financial support? How can you succeed from that perspective that really adds value to the founders? Because it's, you know, being a founder is not easy. And you need somebody by the staff who actually does help you get to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not really done by just writing a check and then say goodbye, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Entrepreneur, just call me when you exit. You know, you need to be engaged. You need to try, and even if you don't know what your value add could be, you need to have conversation with the entrepreneur or entrepreneurs, you know, to find this out. I think. At the very least, every investor could be somehow the extension of a sales team, right? You know, whatever the product or service that the company is doing, as an investor, you may try to, to sell this to others as well. And being in constant dialogue, I think just, you know, maybe sounds very simple, but <clears throat> it's probably really very, very helpful. And to, to learn what or how it is going within, within the company making an introduction to a possible, you know, person that can help, you know, using your network that you actually already have. Most of the investors already have a very large 
network of other possible investors, other possible clients, other possible business partners, that an introduction can be really helpful. And learn the product, you know, more and more and learn to use the product maybe yourself and, and try to be really a mentor and coach for the entrepreneur. Maybe you already are somehow on the board if you had a significant investment in the company and then you this already anyway. But I think it's not only the board that should be like a coach and mentor to the entrepreneur or CEO, it should be maybe every other angel investor that has the money in that company as well. Right, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it, it, I'm pretty sure you and I can talk about this probably for the rest of the uh, episode, because for, you know, for an investor to really develop that particular skill set, and I'm very big on having some type of expertise in a certain area for an, an investor so that they can come in and actually um, almost exercise that experience or that expertise in a particular area and help the founder from that perspective, and really demonstrate their ability to either make proper introductions or really look under the hood and help with some of the technology architecture. I think there's so many different ways that angel investors can really build that brand almost for themselves, that they're there not just to help from financial standpoint, but really deliver value from whatever their expertise is in. So thanks for sharing that insight. Um, when it comes to building a deal flow, I always look for diversity from that perspective, at least for myself, where I like to have almost like three different streams where I have uh, and almost like an elite elite flow, uh, the kind of something that's standard and something that's a little bit extremely early stage. I don't want to call that subpar, but something that's extremely, extremely early that has a potential down the road. So I like to kind of segregate those in three categories. What's your take on building a quality deal flow when it comes to for other angel investors to be able to expose themselves to as many awesome startups as possible. Yeah, and I think you said it, you know, the keyword of diversity and not only diversity in the stage, also diversity where the entrepreneur comes from, diversity from an industry point of view, diversity from a product point of view, you know, business to business, business to consumers. Specifically for us, for our HBS Alumni Angels Group, you know, where we all invest as members, as individuals, everybody has a different investment strategy. Some are much more into very early stage. Some would not even touch early stage. They want to have more later stage. Some are kind of like open to everything, but kind of like, you know, prefer a specific industry because we actually serving all type of industries and all type of, you know, stages for an entrepreneur to be in. It's important for us to really have a little bit of everything. And when I say a little bit of everything, I really mean like from a size point of view, from a stage point of view, from a gender point of view, from anything where you can see, you know, where diversity is important. And, you know, making sure that quality is going to drive quantity. So we hardly put somebody on a stage and say, okay, please pitch in front of us if you're not really convinced that this is something that we could invest. So we rather have nobody, you know, pitching than, you know, a, a low quality company or a company which is not ready or a company that doesn't even know where, where they want to go. So we have to really be selective in a way with our applicants, you know, that are applying to pitch in front of the HBS alumni angels and really take, you know, what you usually say the creme de la creme, where you have like the best of the best, you know, pitching. And it makes it hard on one end, you know, to basically selecting those good companies makes it then difficult at pitch night because you know we have then like three or four really fantastic uh, companies and we cannot just you know take them always on and invest in all of them so we have to be a little bit selective and we believe that maybe you know right now we are relatively small we have in the past two years we had about eight or nine pitch nights each one had about you know three companies presenting that resulted in about five or six companies we made investments. And maybe we're not as known as other angels group here in the area, but we are a niche, you know, angels group in a way, you know, specifically because we are volunteer based and because we don't have that high resource to actually go really deep and do all the diligence, you know, in a long fashion, we have to be a little bit picky and kind of like choose the things that we know very well, where we have the expertise. 
And sometimes that drives a little bit what kind of companies we can select on which industries uh, we, we're going to go. Even, you know, I'm actually proud to say that in the past, we really had anything and everything type of industries. Uh, we really had all type of industries represented in our pitch nights, and we hope that's going to continue to be the case. Right, right, right. Absolutely. That's a great intel. Um, I want to spend some time talking about a topic that comes up a lot in conversations with prospective founders who, whom at least, you know, I'm interested in investing to all for us as a HBS uh, association. Uh, you posted an article, which I thought was very informative um, on the differences between the different structures of the investment when it comes to whether that's a convertible node, whether that's a safe model or a KISS, um, at least from a standpoint of convertible node versus safe. And safe being a relatively new concept coming out of Y Combinator several years ago, but it's been gaining a lot of ground, especially you know amongst extremely early stage founders. Can you tell us a little bit about what are the key differences are and what are some of the pitfalls to avoid when it comes to structuring a particular deal, whether a convertible node or safe and any intel that you can share would be appreciated. Yeah, and this is always kind of like the million dollar question, right? In the beginning, when an entrepreneur starts to look for funding, you know, what kind of structure should it be? You know, so the preferred stock or the straight equity uh, used to be and probably still is probably the safest from an investor point of view, but it's always uh, a long process, you know, because the preferred stock is really asking for all details at the beginning. You know, you have to know what kind of valuations that you have as a company, what happens if what, and so on. So then the next step was or is the convertible note. A convertible note is a little bit easier takes less time to actually make put on paper and have an agreement because it defers the question of how much the company is worth. You know, the value of the venture is not important at the beginning. There's maybe a cap that you're negotiating, but you're actually converting at the later stage when you know what the value should be of, of that company or specifically when you actually have another round of financing and you know more about the valuation. Now the SAFE and the KISS, right? SAFE stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity, which is exactly doing this. It's actually really looking at the future equity. So you don't have to worry about the valuation right now. And the KISS, which stands for, you know, keep, keep it simple security. Both of them, you know, the SAFE and the KISS have been invented to really make it easy and straightforward for the entrepreneur to raise money. And the SAFE, specifically is something where you kind of like say, you know what, I, I need money now. So let's give me the money and we worry about the details later in a way. And the case, you know, is similar, but has a little bit more standard features in it. For example, the case tells you or has a valuation cap. Usually they have a clear maturity date, meaning it's clear at what time, you know, you're going to convert. And uh, it's also, you know, a little bit safer when it comes to uh, investor rights and so on. But both the safe in case, you know, has been designed to do around relatively quickly. And the convertible note requires a little bit more digging, a little bit more negotiating to actually come to an agreement. And of course, you know, the preferred stock is even more and, and really requires a long time of finding the right terms and conditions and evaluations before you go actually into agreement. There is no, you know, one fits all approach. So every venture is different and every has different, you know, needs and requirements. I would say a safe is clearly uh, not a bad option if a lot of items are not really clear at the beginning. It's not really clear how long it's going to take until the company is going to do a next financing round. It's not really clear what's the value. You know, a lot of more uncertainties, you know, but they really need kind of like, you know, funding now to get started. And uh, a preferred stock is really ideal when everything is really clear what it is. And I would say the convertible note is a little bit something in between, where you can actually get some funding relatively quickly. Um, but it's also very favorable from an investment point of view, because it still gives you some good minimum investment uh, protection and investor rights. 
Great. No, thank you for that. It was a great uh, summary analysis of some of the key features and the differences between those models because it's, you know, it could be complicated, especially if you haven't been exposed to that particular, you know, model or, you know, how the, these contracts are structured. It's, it could be, it could be overwhelming for some founders or even investors on that side. So definitely thank you for that. And, you know, for in our show notes and episode notes, we'll make a link to an article that Christian wrote on LinkedIn. I thought it was very concise and very clearly articulated in terms of the key differences, which I think a lot of um, a lot of founders or you know new investors can definitely benefit from. Christian, from a standpoint of where do you see HBS Alumni Angels going in the next period? What are your what's your vision there? What's uh, kind of or at least what's the ambition? Where where are we going uh, in the next uh, several years? Well, the goal is clearly to be here for entrepreneurs, you know, to spot the right ventures, you know, to be here for our members, you know, to a, educate them, bring them speakers. It's not just about angel investing. You know, we also, it's in the end, you know, we are an alumni organization, you know, which is having a lot of a social aspect of getting together and doing alumni events and, and speaker events and education and so on. And I would love to see us, you know, grow more and also be known more, you know, for entrepreneurs, you know, to consider to actually, you know, consider having investments with the HBS alumni angels. It's always a two-way street. And we are, I think, committed to do our part of it and do what we can to make an entrepreneur successful. And from an entrepreneur point of view, you know, it's also always interesting to see the possibilities that they actually have and the different angels groups that actually exist. So we are an angels group that is a little bit more hands-on. Our members <clears throat> have to be a little bit more hands-on by design because you know, we are not having a lot of staff to actually do items and selections and organization of pitch nights and so on. So we have a little bit that dependency and I'm gonna hope, you know, I, I really hope that we're gonna grow in, in membership we're going to grow in companies that we have made investments in, and we're going to continue to nurture the companies we have already made investments and help them to be successful. We're not really thinking at exits, you know, when we start. I mean, obviously, every investor has somehow in mind what's going to be the return on investment, but we're really trying to approach it in a way where we can say, okay, what is needed right now for this company to be successful and if we see the potential and if we see the hyper growth and if we see that this is really going to go somewhere investors will come automatically anyway so that is something we want to kind of like be very careful about to evaluate you know the right ventures to make an engagement but also be here for them to um, to coach them nurture them and mentor them, you know, in their future ventures. I love that. Uh, and something that really stood out as you were talking about this, that we're not necessarily here for, you know, one reason only for those massive exits and for the startups to go IPO or whatever the case may be, but that it's a long-term play. We're here long-term. We're here to commit the resources and the time and everything that we have to help the startups that we invest in, you know, succeed. So I think it's a completely different mindset. It's not something that come in, let me invest and uh, make a quick buck and exit. It's a completely different philosophy and mentality. So I love the sound of that. And Christian, in conclusion, share with us, what are your sources for learning? What's your content diet is looking like? What do you, what do you feed your brain these days? Share with us your, your, uh, your secret uh, bookmarks. <laughs> not sure if I have a secret, you know, but I, I have kind of like a standard, you know, news outlets online that I go to on a regular basis. And it's a mix. You know, I would say like I, you know, being international and actually, you know, from Switzerland, I actually listen to a lot of radio. I listen to a lot of Swiss radio, you know, so I'm a Swiss radio listener. I am a more British German newspaper reader. And probably you can say I'm more watching TV, American TV for entertainment. So here you have it in a way, you know, a little bit of a mix of everything. I'm trying to, you know, have 
a little bit of a time to do all three every day. It doesn't work out every day like this, but at least that's the goal. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. That's a very diverse way to look at this. And is there a book that you always recommend to others? And why is that? Or what, what are you currently reading? What I'm, well, I'm actually currently reading something that I've read already a few times in the past. And it's the book called How Will You Measure Your Life? It's from Clayton Christensen. Oh, yeah. Clayton is an uh, HBS professor. And I had the pleasure to, he was my professor and I was at HBS. And it's interesting that the title says, how will you measure your life? And it's actually coming from an HBS professor. And he really very nicely can put those things together, you know, be successful in business and, and everything, but also kind of like, you know, be successful in your life. And what does it mean you know, to be successful in your life? So I can, you know, highly recommend this type of book. That's awesome. I love that recommendation. And I'll add that to my growing list of all the books that I that I want to read. And I have to uh, figure out how to make time for that. Christian, thanks so much for your time today. Very, very insightful conversation. Uh, I personally learned quite a bit. We'll, we'll stay in touch. And we perhaps we're going to do another episode next year to see how much have changed and transpired. And looking forward to uh, catching up then. Excellent. And we'll sure a lot will have changed and you know, be different in a year from now. So thank you very much for the invitation.